Okay, hello everybody. This is Dr. Pruitt. We're going to be talking about uh, the basics of ECMO today and going through what it is and when we use it in the pre-hospital setting. So the first question in everybody's mind is what is ECMO? And what it stands for is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, which means basically extracorporeal is outside of the body. Membrane is a fancy thing that we have to act as an artificial lung, and oxygenation is a means of delivery of oxygen to tissues when the heart and the lungs are not working. You might also hear it referred to as eCPR or enhanced CPR or enhanced life support. Really what you need to know about this is that it's a form of short-term life support for potentially reversible heart or lung failure. It's not something that's a long-term solution. It is actually a bridge to a fixable problem. It can do the work of the heart and the lungs until we can fix the problem that's underlying in the heart or the lungs. So the perfect patients that we're looking for are ones that are having stemmies where we can put a stent in the coronary artery, patients that are having a massive PE where we can do a thrombectomy and pull that clot out of the lungs, patients that have a high likelihood of neurological recovery, so um, hypothermic patients perhaps, or patients that have a reversible cause of their disease. Really what this does is the machine is able to provide ventilation and perfusion and do the heart of the lungs. Meanwhile, the hospital staff can be reversing the problem that's underlying the arrest. At the end of the day, the most important thing that we're looking for is good neurologically intact survival. We want to find the patients that can walk out of the hospital and be back at their baseline. If you look at ECMO over the years, you can see that the incidence of ECMO is increasing steadily. This is due to improvements in technology, uh, lighter, more portable devices, more training, and enhanced survivability. So over the last 10 years, we've gone from about 3,500 facilities in the U.S. to almost 6,000 now. It's doubled, and you'll usually see it in academic centers. It's still largely an academic endeavor. We're learning more and more as we do more and more of these cases, and as technology is improving, it's becoming more available to other hospitals. One of the most exciting things about eCPR and why you're seeing more and more programs doing it is the increased survival rates to discharge and the neurologically intact survival. If we can provide good oxygenation and perfusion for the patients who are undergoing cardiac arrest using ECMO, the likelihood of them walking out of the hospital is significantly improved. So if you look at ICU patients who perhaps have a respiratory arrest due to acute respiratory distress syndrome, something like hantavirus or ARDS or bad pneumonia, if we can get them on ECMO in time, 55% of those patients are walking out of the hospital. And if you look at cardiac arrest or eCPR candidates, which are going to be the ones that we identify from the field, those survival rates are up to 38 and 26 percent, respectively, which is a giant increase in what it was before. So how does this work? You all remember um, the way that blood flows to the heart. It comes back to the right side of the heart, deoxygenated, comes in through the superior and inferior vena cava to the right side, goes to the lungs, picks up oxygen, comes back to the left side, and gets pumped to the body. Well, when something in that process is not working, say, for instance, blood can't get to the lungs and pick up oxygen because there's a big clot there, or the heart can't pump effectively because it's undergoing a giant heart attack, where the machine can fit in is that we can actually do the work of the heart and lungs using the ECMO system. So just like the heart pumps blood to the body, the eCPR system has a pump that pumps blood to the body as well. And just like the lungs filters the carbon dioxide out and puts the oxygen in, there's a membrane oxygenator that can do the same work. So basically what we have is a heart and lung bypass machine. Here's some pictures of what a pump looks like. More and more technology is going towards a centrifugal pump that tends to be easier on blood cells and less prone to clotting and is just more efficient. Um, Very portable, pretty small, fairly lightweight. You can see the size of the cannulas there, which is able to pump a significant amount of blood volume per second. And here's a picture of an oxygenator. Again, um, doing the work of the lungs, taking the carbon dioxide out and putting oxygen in. 
This is what it looks at it looks like at a patient bedside. You can see the pump right there to the patient's left, and then you can also see the oxygenator, two very small components with very large amounts of blood flow doing the work of the heart and the lungs. This is what the console looks like, usually at the foot of the bed. As you're looking at this console, I realize it looks like a big apparatus, but really the machine that's doing the majority of the work, if you see that that red ECMO basket on the left there, the little machine with the blue light to the right of it, that's essentially the pump. That's all you need to do, do the work of the heart and the lungs. And that's where you can adjust your flow rate, you can adjust your oxygenation, and set your parameters specific to what your patient is needing at the time. One very important thing to note about putting people on ECMO and placing them on the pump is that it does take some very large cannulas in order to be able to circulate these large volumes of blood to do the work of the heart and the lungs. So it is a surgical procedure and it can be um, a little bit bloody because you can see the size of the cannulas that are going into the patient there in the groin. It takes a very highly skilled and highly trained person to be able to place those in the correct position. There's two types of ECMO. There, and this is kind of where ECMO got its start, is venovenous is basically the type of ECMO that does the work of the lungs. It adds oxygen, removes CO2, doesn't necessarily need to do the work of the heart. It's only um, basically helping bad lungs. And the patients that usually benefit from this are ICU patients who either have maybe a terrible flu, terrible pneumonia. In New Mexico, where we got this start was with our hantavirus. Uh, patients, they seem to benefit the most from this. If you look at the chest x-rays on the right, you see the upper chest x-ray there has nice uh, two big black lungs that are full of air and oxygenating nicely. That's what a normal chest x-ray looks like. If you look at the x-ray below it, those lungs are full of either fluid or pus or inflammation and are not able to do any oxygen exchange. And so that is a patient that would likely benefit from venovenous ECMO to do the work of the lungs until they have a chance to recover and circulate oxygen normally. This kind of thing usually occurs in the hospital setting. This is what a venovenous patient would look like while they're on the cannula, on the pump. You can see the cannulas in the groin there. They're fairly large and um, circulating blood for the patient while the lungs are resting and trying to heal. Here's another look at a different way to cannulate. This is actually the two different cannulas going into different um, vascular sites in the neck. You can see the cannula on top is a brighter red sort of blood. That's the oxygenated blood, and the cannula below it is a little bit darker. That's the venous blood that's coming out and receiving the oxygen. Now, veno-arterial ECMO, these are the patients that we're going to be um, bringing to the hospital from the field because these are patients who need support for both the heart and the lungs. These are patients who are usually undergoing cardiogenic shock, septic shock, or some sort of obstructive shock due to either STEMI or PE like we talked about before. Sometimes this also happens in the hospital with patients who are unable to wean from bypass after surgery. Here's a look at the cannulas. One interesting thing to note here is that the cannulas are so large as they're going in and oxygenating blood, delivering oxygenated blood to the body, pulling out the deoxygenated blood. You see that, that little white cannula there to the far right? Because the cannulas are so large, sometimes they can stop blood flow to the leg. And so we actually have to reperfuse the leg, put some blood back in and direct it the opposite way so that the leg is actually receiving blood flow. And that takes a whole extra, extra line just to keep that leg alive because the cannulas are so large. This is a patient who is on ECMO. Um, I've actually seen this myself. I had a, a man arrest in front of me from a large pulmonary embolism. We got him on the pump within 35 minutes, and the next day I was able to go up to the ICU, and while he was on the machine, was awake and watching football. And this is a man who probably would have died if it hadn't been a witnessed arrest in the hospital. Um, it's a pretty amazing machine, and it can definitely save lives. And it's pretty amazing to see. 
it all comes down to choosing the right patient. And this is where EMS comes in and our biggest job. Like we talked about, the biggest thing we want to find is patients who have reversible causes where that we can help them survive neurologically intact and fix the problem. So ideal candidates are going to be ones that are having massive stemmies like this one. Um, where we can go in and uh, place a stent or maybe even a massive pulmonary embolus. I don't know how many of you have ever seen a CAT scan with a saddle PE. I know we talk about it a lot, but this is actually what it looks like. If you, this is a cross section of a chest, so you can see the, pretend you're standing at the patient's foot of the bed. So the left lung is actually on your right and the right lung is actually on your left. And you can see the pulmonary arteries, which are delivering blood to the lungs to pick up oxygen. And you see how there's that gray clot there that straddles across the middle. That's what a saddle embolus looks like. So that heart is actually not able to pump any blood to the lungs, and it's causing obstructive shock. And so this is a patient where if we were able to circulate the blood for this heart using ECMO, um, we could give them a chance to get that clot out of there and reestablish perfusion and let the heart and lungs do it, do its work. Another perfect candidate would be a hypothermic patient. We've actually had this happen in Albuquerque uh, this January. A gentleman whose core temperature was about 61 arrived at the hospital and they were able to get him on the pump and keep him alive and he walked out of the hospital totally neurologically intact about a week later. Just a quick look at a hypothermic EKG. Usually they're going to be bradycardic with a long QT, and it's a perfect example of some Osborne waves that you can see there. So it all comes down to finding the right patient. So who's eligible for this? We want to identify these patients ideally within the first six minutes of our arrival on scene. So in order to be a candidate for transport, the patients have to meet every single one of these criteria. They have to be an adult between the ages of 18 to 75, it must be a witnessed arrest with bystander CPR. End title on arrival must be greater than 10, and it has to be a presumed reversible cause of the arrest. If uh, we're suspecting a heroin overdose or pre presumed hypoxic arrest, uh, maybe COPD patient that uh, was hypoxic prior to our arrival, those are patients where likely they've incurred too much brain damage prior to our arrival that um, fixing the underlying cause wouldn't be beneficial for them because their likelihood of neurologically intact survival is too low. So warm water drownings and trauma patients and hanging are also in this category. The other very important inclusion criteria is that the initial rhythm must be anything other than asystole. So right now if you have a shockable rhythm, VTAC, VFib, even PEA, those patients are eligible, but if you arrive in the patients in asystole, um, that's a no-go. Patients must meet every single one of these criteria and probably the most important one that's going to be a big make or break thing for our crews is that they have to be on pump within 60 minutes of collapse. And what that means for us is that every second counts. And what we're saying is that we need to be able to have them to the hospital within 35 minutes of collapse. And that's going to leave the team at the hospital about 20 minutes to get those large cannulas in and get them on the pump. There's also patients that even if they do meet inclusion criteria, they might have some of these exclusion criteria. And if patients have any of these, that means they're not el eligible. So if they have poor underlying neurological status, perhaps a prior CVA with neurological deficits, a uh, large amount of medical comorbidities like liver or kidney failure, ongoing malignancy, irreversible bleeding problems, you can see why that would be an issue. Um, morbid obesity, where maybe access to the groin would be incredibly difficult, or non-cardiac causes of arrest, like we mentioned, trauma or hanging or warm water, anything where you're suspecting a hypoxic arrest that led to a cardiac arrest, those patients are not candidates. Again, we mentioned, I know there's a, the ideal candidates for this are going to be our young 35, 45-year-olds who undergo cardiac arrest, and unfortunately a lot of those in our system are ones who we suspect heroin overdose, but um, heroin usually leads to a hypoxic arrest, and if we're suspecting that, then these patients are not candidates, unfortunately. Really what it comes down to is the patients who are going to have a neurologically intact survival. So there are complications. That happen with ECMO, patients can bleed, patients can clot. You saw those large cannulas in the groin. There can be nerve damage. There can be lack of blood flow to the limb. Sometimes there's infection. Um, 
and or neurological injury. These are usually very small complications and in the big picture of things, um, the benefit largely outweighs the risk. If you look at UNM, this is super exciting. On the left, you see ELSO. That's basically the national average of survival rates for eCPR candidates. You'll see the venovenous, that's just the lungs in the blue. The VA is the heart and the lung bypass, that's in red. And then the actual patients who are in cardiac arrest is the green bars. And if you look at UNM's overall, we're exceeding the national average pretty significantly in all three categories, and it's really exciting to see. But what this comes down to, again, like we're emphasizing, is selecting the right patients. And uh, when we do, what we see is fantastic outcomes. So right now, UNM's been doing this for about two and a half years, and 43% of our eCPR patients have been discharged neurologically intact, and compared to the national average of about 28. So it's, it's pretty exciting, and our team there is doing a fantastic job. So if we want to talk about specifics for our system and how this is going to affect us, this is a quick peek at what the guideline might look like that's going to be released in July um, once we've had the ability to get all crews in the systems trained to start to recognize these patients. For now, after you've received this training, what we're doing is giving you a quick cheat sheet of inclusion and exclusion criteria that's included in the Lucas device so you can have there as a reference and now that you've been trained if you start to recognize these patients in the field and think you have someone who meets all the inclusion criteria and doesn't have any of the exclusion criteria you'll have that checklist right there with you and um, if it's before July we're asking that you just call the 78 to confirm so they can start to get things rolling on the hospital side but these criteria will be available to you, and as soon as you're trained on this, um, if you recognize these patients, you're good to go. Right now, UNM is the only hospital that is doing this, so if you do find these candidates, that's the only destination where you can take them. And it's actually the only one in the state. So what you can expect if it is a normal cardiac arrest dispatch is that they're going to recognize these patients from the point of the phone call and notify you while you're en route to the scene that this could be a possible ECMO candidate based on the patient age, a witness arrest, and bystander CPR. It's going to be up to the rest of the crew to get there and confirm the other inclusion and exclusion criteria when they get to the scene. So while you're en route to the scene, it'll be incumbent on the officers to think about transport times to the hospital, possible downtime, how close you are, and if you can get the patient to the hospital within 35 minutes of collapse. Review those criteria that we've talked about and start to divide up on-scene actions so s things go smoothly and everybody knows their role when they get onto the scene. What I'd like to see from the lead provider, ideally this would be the rescue lieutenant or the first on-scene paramedic, but it can also be the engine officer if they're first because really the job of that lead officer is going to be to gather the patient history and run through the inclusion exclusion checklist. So talk to the bystander, get the history, how long have they been down, did they get bystander CPR, confirm all the inclusion criteria, and then once you have done that, it'll be up to that officer to contact AAS base and just initiate an ECMO alert with more details to follow once you load the patient. What that'll do is get the hospital team mobilized, much like a STEMI or stroke alert. There's a team that needs to come downstairs and be ready to receive the patient. So the sooner we can give them a heads up to get ready, the better it's going to be um, when the patient gets to the hospital. Meanwhile, while that first in officer is con confirming the criteria, what we need from the engine crew and the rest of the team is to really focus on fantastic BLS. This is the most important piece because this is what we know saves patients and really saves perfusion to the brain. So we want to see really good pit crew CPR, get the Lucas device on and the monitor on as quickly as you can. Two of those big inclusion criteria are going to be the initial rhythm. So get that monitor on quickly, make sure it's not asystole. And then once you establish an airway, get that end title as well because it needs to be greater than 10. So you're going to help that officer by getting the monitor on, getting the airway on, obtaining an end title, and thinking ahead and preparing for load and go if this is a patient that you think is going to meet all the steps in the checklist. It's okay if some of our times, I know everybody's a little bit competitive with their code stat numbers for these selected patients, we still want to do good 
BLS, but understanding that within those first six minutes, there's going to be so much happening that those code stat numbers might take a little bit of a hit. That's okay. Really, we want to do this within the first six minutes and get them off the scene as quickly as we can while being efficient. I can't emphasize enough that good basic life support is the most important step for these patients. So we want to do fantastic CPR, early defibrillation if we can, manage that airway aggressively and efficiently with a good respiratory rate and good tidal volumes, and get that early epi on. Now the ultimate question is going to be, can you get to the UNM within 35 minutes of the initial collapse? You might be surprised, so don't be afraid to use Google Maps or some other device that can tell you what traffic is looking like, because I've seen patients get to the hospital in time from either Rescue 8 or even Rescue 22. Um, so don't think that just because you're a little bit farther away, you can't make it. Now, once you've made the decision to transport, while you're en route, the things that you can do are manage that airway, like we mentioned, keep that respiratory rate between 8 and 10, give good tidal volumes, monitor that end tidal, Get your IV and your IO access and give your ACLS meds, whether that's epinephrine or lidocaine. And one thing that you can really do to help the hospital get ready for these patients is to expose their groin and get them ready for cannulation. So get work on getting those clothes off, cutting them off, getting them exposed so it'll be one less step for the hospital when they get there. Now a big question that comes up is how often are we going to be doing this because it's a big change to what we normally do. Um, Actually, I don't think it's going to be that often. So more likely, maybe one, maybe two patients a week in the whole system, especially for the nine echoes, that timeline is going to, I think, really be a limiting factor. So I think the patients we're going to see this most likely in are going to be our 31 deltas or our six deltas who code right in front of us. So we'll know that they have a witnessed arrest and immediate bystander CPR with good BLS. If you look at our numbers from February, just trying to project forward, we had 55 total cardiac arrests in that month. 23 of them were witnessed, but only five of them got bystander CPR. So right there, we're at only five for the entire month, and that's not counting distance from the hospital. So I really think it'll probably be one or fewer per week of the nine echoes. But that's not taking into account the ones who do arrest right when we get there. So what you can include in your radio report once you're on the way to the hospital, let them know, again, this is an ECMO alert. They want to hear all your criteria. So once you get there, you're really going to get quizzed on whether or not they met the inclusion criteria. How long were they down? Was it witnessed? Did they get bystander CPR? What was your initial rhythm? So if you have all that ready to go, it's really going to make things more smooth for you at the hospital. So a couple what-if scenarios. Here's a map of Albuquerque. If you're kind of looking at the bubble around the university where you think you can get there within 35 minutes, there's big question marks in the outlying kind of donut. Again, don't be afraid to use Google Maps to see what your, what your timeline is going to be like. Um, in the future, looking forward, there might actually be a capability for the team to come to the scene, and we're working on that right now logistically to figure out what that might look like. Ideally, that'll be able to be rolled out in July with the official guideline for the rest of the system as well. So what happens if they arrest in the back of the ambulance? These are the ones I actually think we're going to most commonly find are our best candidates. Just like normal, do your really good BLS and ACLS. Evaluate those criteria very quickly, and if they meet them, and you're on your way to another hospital, I'll leave it up to the officer to consider diversion to UNM. And you can do that in conjunction with the family as well. If you do make the decision to go to UNM, make sure you're calling that ECMO alert and getting the team ready as fast as you can. These are likely going to be our most, most uh, frequent candidates.